I've been uh, wo working on those, uh, as a hobby, on those robots since about a year. And uh, it actually, the whole story started about two years ago when we decided to start a uh, hackerspace in, in our city, in Podlań. Uh, the hackerspace is called Nigma Labs. This is the logo. Because, you know, when you start with something, you start with the logo face, right? The most important thing, and the rest somehow works. And as you can imagine, it didn't really work very well. Although we, we are still uh, alive, the, the hackerspace is still working. We are like a virtual hackerspace without a space, but still somehow this works. And we started to look for different projects to do different hacks to, 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 to actually attract people and, and so on. So, for instance, we started with this robot that, uh, personally, I started with that. It's a very simple analog robot that is supposed to go towards light. It's not completely assembled on this photo. That's why you don't see the connections and so on. But it's very small and uh, very easy to make. And actually, we never, I never got it to work. So I was kind of very much discouraged by this. Uh, but at some point, I decided, OK, let's do something bigger. Maybe bigger will be easier. And I decided that maybe a walking robot, like, you know, crab-like uh, uh, robot, would, would, be, would be nice to make. So I got some Meccano uh, set uh, because I realized that, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm going to remake it many times to, to fix my mistakes. So I need something that's easy to, to correct, right? So Meccano said something like, like a great idea. Turns out that my first mistake was using a Meccano set <laughs> because it's too heavy, really. And this robot didn't really work very well. Uh, it has a servo controller, which uh, I bought one that allowed you to record servo positions and play them back without any computer, any additional computer for it. So I thought I will just, you know, record all the positions and play it and it, it will walk. And it didn't. I mean, it would trip, it would fall down, it would uh, just uh, randomly move on the table and that didn't work. Yeah, the how I moved the legs there. The easiest way to do it is by using the so-called RC servers or hobby servers. Those are basically small motors with, uh, with a gearbox on them and with some electronics that lets you set the position in which they should be and they will automatically hold that position for you so you don't have to worry about that. 
you control them by modulated signal that's called PWM. Uh, we, we heard about that in the previous talk. And one thing you have to be careful about is the current draw, that they, the current that they draw. So uh, if a servo works against a big uh, force, it can draw up to a small servo like I use. Uh, it can draw up to 500 milliamperes. That's, that's basically what you get from a uh, USB port. That's maximum what you, you can get from USB. So at this point, you cannot power anything else. And if you have, like, you have uh, eight of those servos because you need two for uh, each leg to raise the leg and to move it forward, right? Uh, you really need an external power source for that. Okay, uh, the servos also have one very important rating that's called torque, which basically means how strong it is. And it's usually uh, they use uh, a unit that is not compatible with the SE units, but uh, they use uh, uh, kilograms times centimeters. And if a servo has like two kilograms times centimeter, it means that on, on a lever uh, one centimeter long, like uh, there, it can, it can rise and hold one kilogram, right? If you make the arm two centimeters, uh, sorry, if it's two centimeter, uh, uh, two, two kilogram centimeters, it can rise two kilograms. If you make the arm two centimeters long, it will be only one kilogram. If you make it four centimeters long, it will be half a kilogram, right? It's linear. So if, if your robot has like half a meter long legs, then good luck. Anyways, yeah, metal gears, bearings, whatever. Uh, so that robot didn't work either. Sometimes later, later a friend of mine was doing an Arduino workshop in, in our uh, city and I was helping him. And I got to actually discover, well, I've heard about Arduino before, but I never used one. And here I, I got to, to actually use one and I got to make people use one. And I learned that the big Arduino board that you can buy for $40 is not actually the best choice for, for hobby projects like this because there is this board that's called Pro Mini that has exactly the same electronics as Arduino board. It's much smaller, you can put it into your project, and costs two dollars from China, <laughs> of course. So much better uh, approach, and they are very easy to program because you just you just start the IDE, you just connect them. Uh, in case of Pro Mini, it doesn't have a USB uh, because that would, be, would make it more expensive. Instead, you have to use a programmer like this. You connect it and, and program it through this. But then you leave it in your project. You can reuse the programmer for other projects, right? Okay, so... The first uh, version of Kubik was uh, born. Uh, as you can see, it still has only two servos per, le per leg, but I actually used a Raspberry Pi to control the legs, so I could make some calculations and act actually move the legs in, in the trajectories that I wanted. Uh, I communicated with the servo controller through a serial port on the Pi, so I just sent the positions for the servos to the serial port and, and it would magically work. And all the control was through Wi-Fi. I actually have this robot here with me, but it, it had several iterations, so it doesn't look quite exactly the same. <laughs> uh, and it had uh, a little uh, accident during the transportation in, in the plane, so I won't be I won't be switching it on, so because the, the one of the legs is broken. But I can open it and you can see. Uh, 
Indeed, it has a Raspberry Pi in here and a servo controller. This is a amplifier for the speaker, so it's also with the speaker. And battery, whatever. Uh, okay, about batteries. The first version used, I tried to use alkaline batteries like you put in your TV remotes or anything. And that was a big mistake. Uh, then I switched to rechargeable batteries, like uh, nickel, uh, like uh, nickel, uh, iron batteries, and, and you know the, the rechargeable ones, the 1.2 volt, and that worked better because mm -hmm. they they actually can give you much more current, so the servos don't, the servos actually work properly, because they s behave very strangely if the current is too low for them. And they lasted much more, and I could re recharge them, which is also a nice feature. But unfortunately, they are very heavy. And in case of this robot, you see this servo has to carry the weight of this whole robot. So the heavier it is, the, the harder it is. Uh, so yeah. The best option so far is the lithium polymer batteries. They sell for hobby uh, planes and helicopters and stuff like that. Uh, they're actually pretty nice. Uh, there are, however, a, uh, a pro option because uh, if you discharge them too much, you can throw them away because you won't be able to charge them back to their full capacity. If you overcharge them, or if you short circuit them, or if you somehow drop them on the floor or uh, puncture them, they will uh, explode in flame and toxic fumes. And the flame is <laughs> impossible to distinguish. Uh, extinguish, sorry. Uh, so, so have a steel pot in uh, in reach of your hands to put it in and, and wait for, for it to, to st stop burning. But they use it on the RC planes, right? <laughs> Which sometimes crash, crash on the floor. So that's not, I've never had a, a battery explode on me. <laughs> uh, I, ha I did break one by discharging it too much. So that's that's real uh, thing. Okay, cubic two. Because walking with just two servos wasn't too easy, because moving the leg forward and backward, it doesn't actually move in a straight line, it moves in an arc. So I had to add uh, another set of servos here to actually be able to compensate for this arc and to move the legs in straight lines. So with three servos, you can actually put the end of the leg in any place in space you want. You just have to do some math. Uh, with the LiPo battery, I had to use also a voltage regulator. Because uh, LiPos change the voltage as, as they discharge very much. So I needed to keep it at uh, five volts, basically, for Raspberry Pi. So I used a regulator. And yeah, there is a USB joystick you can connect to it. And, and I had uh, like a toy, like RC toy to play with. OK, how do you walk, actually? So walking is actually very simple. You just move your body forward. And then when you're about to, to trip, you move your leg. And then you again move your body forward, and then you again move your body. And basically, that's how it works. Uh, of course, there are some tricks to that. You have to prevent going too far, because then you run out of the legs and, and you fall down. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can move continuously all the time and just add the leg, move the legs as, as you need them, or you can. Move the legs, then move a little bit forward, and move the legs again, and so on. And the order in which you move the legs actually matters. 
because you always have to move the one that is uh, the one leg that is left backwards uh, the most have to be moved forward in, in the first place, right? Otherwise, you, you are running, uh, you will have to stop at some time and to move all the legs in, in the right position. Uh, so, I was working on that. Then I, after the Arduino thing, I decided, what if I used Arduino in a robot? So that's how I made microcubic. Okay. It actually only has Arduino on board. It doesn't have any real computer. <laughs> and, but I still wanted to program it in Python, right? Because Python is a very nice language and I can program it very fast. So it was a problem for me. Uh, that Arduino, Arduino obviously can't run Python. So I thought, okay, what if I used Bluetooth to send just the servo positions to the robot and program everything in Python on my computer? So that's what I did. I just have to tear. Hmm. With it. <laughs> okay, the robot also has an accelerometer in it. It's displayed here. You can see when I'm moving it. I'm not using the accelerometer for anything right now, but I hope I will be able to program it. So as, as I said, uh, you just move your body forward, right? And when you are forward, you just, whoops. <laughs> An exception. <laughs> Anyways. You can also rotate. And if you move your legs while you are rotating, <laughs> right. You can also go backwards, but it's a little bit <laughs> unstable. Remote-controlled toy is not very much fun, right? So I wrote another program for it. Uh, I installed a distance sensor in here, infrared distance sensor in this case. So it can read uh, distance to the nearest uh, object in front of it. And I have a simple program. Okay, it's confused. I don't see anything. Yeah, the idea is that <laughs> the idea is that it should move towards the nearest thing or backwards if it's too close. Yeah. But I think that I oh and when it doesn't see anything it will uh, what, uh, move its head uh, around to, to see that nearest object. Uh, see me? Yeah, so this way I can move a little and it will follow me.
So that, that is my second robot. And uh, I actually discovered an important thing with it, that uh, making a small robot is much cheaper and easier than making a big robot. <laughs> Mostly because you can just, you, you know, I'm just using the, the plastic holes they actually give you with the, with the servos. I don't have any extra materials. Like here you have metal, you have bearings, you have uh, a lot of additional materials. Here, just the box is custom. So it's the smaller the, it, it is, the easier it is to build and the cheaper it will be. Uh, more about walking. Uh, so there is this thing where have you, you have seen it, it trips at some point. It's, it just trips over its own legs and it falls down on the floor. Why? Because its uh, middle of the mass is outside its support area. Support area is the area on the floor between its legs. If you connect all the legs together, the ones that are on the floor, and if you raise one leg, uh, you only have three legs on the floor, you have to make sure that the uh, center of the mass is over the support area. And to do that, you actually have to like, uh, move the body sideways a little bit when you are walking to make sure that it's always uh, that, that you are stable. Uh, and that's, of, uh, of course, ignoring the inertia. Because with inertia, you actually have to make sure that the, it's well within the support area, not just on the edge, because inertia will still trip it. Uh, OK, how the leg is constructed. I, I don't think it's so important. Uh, one important <laughs> thing is that when the leg is stretched, you have much bigger lever there and needs much bigger strength to, to move it than when it's uh, close to the body. So uh, it's always good to think about how, how long your legs are and, and which segments of the legs are uh, long. For example, uh, this segment of the leg, the coxa, it can be arbitrarily long because it doesn't carry the weight of the robot, right? It just moves this way, not this way. This servo is actually has to be the strongest. OK. So to move the leg to an arbitrary position, you actually have to do some calculations. And fortunately, for just three degrees of freedom, you can do that with simple trigonometry. Uh, unfortunately, with any, as with any physical object that you are programming, it's actually hours of debugging, and it always does the opposite thing. And with this guy, I replaced the servos at some point, and it turned out the new servos were rotating in the opposite directions than, than the old ones, and it literally tore its legs off. <laughs> <laughs> The, the servers are strong enough to carry it. They are also strong enough to actually tear apart. And yeah, so a lot of gluing <laughs> was going on there. Yeah, and as I said, the order of uh, moving the legs matters a lot too. Uh, here I'm using uh, uh, order that's, that's called creep guide. It's uh, how cats actually walk when they are creeping up to, to the mouse or, or something like that. Uh, you can see uh, if, if the forward direction is up, you can see how you should move, in what order you should move the legs. It's actually by diagonals, right? So first you move the front left, then you move the, the back right uh, leg and so on. And there are some mathematical proofs that this actually maximizes the stability uh, in, in the sense that the, the middle, uh, 
that the middle of the mass is well inside the, the area of support most of the time. A at least for, for all possible combinations, it's, this is the best one. Uh, yeah, and the speed depends on the uh, so-called duty cycle. So duty cycle is the time between moving each leg, basically. And you can speed up, you can move even faster uh, by moving not one leg at a time, but for example, two legs at a time. The problem with that is that if you rise two legs, only two legs remain on the, on the floor, and you are not statically stable an, anymore. Uh, so the trick is to do it very fast. <laughs> I did it for this robot. For this robot, it would be impossible because the, the servos are not fast enough to actually do it. Uh, yep. Okay. And the guide where you move two legs at a time is called trot. <laughs> it actually looks like a horse trotting, right? <laughs> okay. That's enough for this one. Uh, yeah, cubic version three. This is actually what, what uh, I have here. Uh, I burned one Raspberry Pi because, as you heard in the last talk, it's not five volt tolerant. <laughs> and I had a five volt serial in there, and it actually burned after two months of use. So not that bad, but still. <laughs> and... Uh, I switched to a different servo controller that uses I2C instead of serial, and that's actually 3.3 volt, so everything should uh, be okay. I put in a bigger battery, stronger servos, and uh, actually with the servos there is, a, there is this one problem. Uh, because at some point I realized I'm just pumping cash into this robot. <laughs> So I have a problem that it's unstable, so I put longer legs into it, right? Then longer legs need stronger servos. Stronger servos need bigger battery. Bigger battery means it's heavier, so I need even stronger servos, and so on and so on. This is a vicious cycle, and I decided, okay, enough of that. That's why I won't demonstrate this robot. It doesn't really work well at the moment, and I really don't have that much incentive to work on it. But then I thought, okay, so maybe I could make uh, the cheapest robot I, I could possibly manage. So I looked at the, uh, at the list of parts for, for, this, for this robot because it, this one was much cheaper first one. And I noticed that, okay, 12 servos. Each servo, at the time I, I bought servos from uh, a place that sold them for about five dollars a piece. So that was most of the cost. 12 times five. So I decided, okay, maybe I can use less servos. So I tried to make this smaller version of this one is called microcubic, so the smaller version is called nanocubic. <laughs> and as you can see, it has only eight servos, two servos per leg, per leg. And I figured out, okay, I cannot have full inverse kinematics, so I cannot really specify exactly the position of, this, of each leg in 3D. 3D because I only have two servos, 
but maybe at least I can specify the position in 2D on the floor by, you know, moving uh, the legs, all the legs. So if I move this leg and move somehow those legs, I just put, keep those four points with heavy mass. And that's why I built this prototype and I started uh, configuring out the map. And I failed. It doesn't work. It just stands there. It, I can't make it walk the way I would like it to walk. Of course, I could always do the thing that I did at the very beginning, record some positions of the servers and just replay them. But that's not what I wanted to do. So this is a failure. So. <laughs> yes? So can't you just, the thing is, they are always going to move in an arc, which is a problem, so they are sliding over there. Yeah, so the idea is that when it moves in arc, it also moves this leg to Fix for the arc. Couldn't you just have both all legs pointing in the same direction, so the arc would be cancelling out themselves? Uh, yes, I thought about that. Well, generally, if anybody has any ideas how to make that work, I will give you my my contact information at at end. We can try to cooperate on that, but. You know, this is not the only way you can arrange eight servos to form LEDs, right? You can use the mammalian approach. And you can have them ver vertically. Okay, it's, it's broken somehow because it's turning. But you get the idea. If you have two servos in the same uh, plane, you can still have inverse cinematics in 2D, in that place, right? Uh, I actually made this work on TV remote. This is, by the way, the cheapest way you can make an, a remote control toy. It's just an infrared uh, receiver and a remote. But yeah, it works as long as you are not trying to turn. <laughs> because then, then it breaks. So partial success, not, not, not perfect. Uh, yeah. Then I discovered some resources. Uh, so you may be interested in those uh, forums. At, at the top, and those IRC channels where people actually discuss making robots. Uh, there is great uh, CAD software, OpenSCAD, and, and Fritzing is for making uh, printed circuit boards and uh, generally designing circuits. Uh, you can buy parts uh, from Adafruit, Sparkphone, Polulu, etc., and they have great documentation. But the real thing is you can buy parts from those sites, which are basically tiny sites. And as I said, um, a servo controller for this, in Adafruit it costs $38. On uh, AliExpress it costs like $4 or something like that. The only problem is shipping, which t takes uh, from two to eight weeks from China. But you can really buy them, especially if you buy more of them, the servos, those servos, uh, $1.50 cents per, per piece if you buy at least 40 of them. So suddenly costs became a non-issue. Uh, and I started experimenting with other things. So I still wanted uh, a robot that would have Python on it uh, by itself. And I read about this uh, MicroPython uh, stuff. And uh, the MicroPython people at some point ported MicroPython to this uh, very cheap ESP8266 uh, or whatever uh, board <laughs> that's basically the, the size of, of a, the size of a post stamp. So I made a robot that uses it. It actually, because this is a Wi-Fi board, you can actually connect 
to Wi-Fi to it, uh, or, or at least you should be able to. I'm sure it will appear any minute now. Yes, it is. And turns out MicroPython is not finished for it. But there was another firmware with Lua on it. And Lua is pretty nice language, similar a little bit to Python. So I went with that. And yeah. mm. I have a Lua prompt here. Uh, I can actually start it. <laughs> it uses four servos and it's called Bob because uh, there is a slightly bigger design that is using pickaxe uh, for, for the Bob robot. So I, I chose it micro Bob because it's a small Bob robot. I still didn't finish it. I want to put some sensors on it so it can uh, avoid obstacles and stuff like that. But the basic idea works. Uh, yeah, I don't have a stop command in there. <laughs> <laughs> I will just switch it there. Uh, We have five minutes left, so quickly. So actual MicroPython works on uh, PyBoard. This is PyBoard. And I have a robot that uses PyBoard. This is Hank. It's a hexapod this time. And I didn't finish programming uh, working for it. So I won't demonstrate you how it, to you how, how it works, actually. Uh, but I'm getting there. It uses PyBoard. Uh, the PyBoard has accelerometer on it, too. So I can use accelerometer. And yes, the other one. I went even smaller than uh, Pico Kubik because I used smaller servos. And this one is using a vocal, which is uh, basically someone took a chip from a router and put it on a very small board with GPIOs. So it actually runs OpenWRT Linux. And it has USB, so I attached a, a camera module from a, from a laptop to it. So it has a laptop camera on it. And let me see if I can stream some, uh, if I will manage to stream some uh, <coughs> picture from it. In a minute, it, it boots. It's a slow CPU, it boots Linux, so takes some time. Uh, this is the one. And let me check. Oh, it is here. So I will SSH to it. Uh, Let me just quickly <coughs> check. Yeah. Mm. And I can start streaming the camera. And that's not the one. So oh, here it is. <laughs> uh, I 
also I'm struggling with some uh, noise on the serial interface because I'm not driving the servos from the vocal board directly. I have an Arduino in there to which I'm speaking through the serial interface to, to do all the movement. And uh, yeah, the problem is uh, there is some noise on that. And that means... <laughs> Oh, right. The board is too small to run Python. It, Python actually doesn't fit in memory there. But it's not too small to run mi MicroPython. So there is a MicroPython version for Linux. They mostly did it for testing. But I use it to, to run uh, the, co the code here. Yeah, and as you can see, there is some... Sometimes it works, and at sometimes it, it gets uh, a little bit nervous, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> so some work is needed on that. That's work in progress. Okay. And that's basically it. Mm -hmm. uh, the future. Oh. Okay, so I'm out of time. So I will just uh, go away. Yeah. So you can write this presentation, uh, give me some feedback, and this is my homepage where there is contact information if you have any questions, or you can catch me here on, on this conference. Thank you very much. Sorry, can you show micro TV? Yeah, 
microcubic. This is uh, this is the one.